Well, the overall topic of free speech has had renewed resonance for the world of the arts since the culture wars of the 1980s and 1990s, which, among other things, had the result of reshaping what our National Endowment for the Arts could fund. My uh, personal professional immersion in free speech issues happened during my 12 years as Cultural Affairs Commissioner for the city of New York under uh, Mayor Mike Bloomberg. And I inherited an agency that had really been battered by the fallout from the sensation show at the Brooklyn Museum, which featured a uh, portrait of the Virgin Mary by the artist Chris Ophelia that among other materials included elephant dung, which attracted the ire of the then mayor who uh, initiated legal proceedings to strip the institution of city funding and evict it from its city-owned building. Um, neither of uh, those procedures succeeded, but shortly thereafter, the then mayor was further incensed by an exhibit that featured a photograph in which Jesus Christ was personated uh, as an African-American female, at which point he impaneled a group of people dubbed the Decency Commission to <laughs> come up with uh, content restrictions for publicly funded art in the city of New York. So uh, these efforts seriously uh, eroded the credibility of my agency, but also the city of New York's over overall commitment to its creative community, which is one of the bedrocks of New York's identity. So um, I certainly had a lot of opportunities in my 12 years to make it better or screw it up. Um, I benefited from the extraordinary leadership of the mayor who told me early days that uh, I was not to interfere in uh, matters of content. Uh, and over the years, my uh, colleagues and I in government de uh, developed various protocols for dealing with uh, challenging material, of which uh, there was a lot. But I can tell you that during that period, I yearned for a conversation like this. So in some ways, my first question is, where were you guys when I needed you? I, I, know, I know where Oscar was. I, one of, I will always take great pride in being able to say I was Oscar's landlady for six years. And we fixed those bathrooms. It was great. Um, that, that, that really worked out. Um, but I, I am acutely aware of how high the stakes are for freedom of speech in the arts. Uh, not only uh, do these issues run the risk of undermining funding options, both public and private, but they really can cause grievous damage to the public trust in arts organizations as arbiters of what we find valuable in our society. So hopefully today's conversation will give us a chance to have a synoptic look at what the current state of free speech issues tells us about the state of the arts in the US, uh, but also what all of us, performers, uh, programmers, patrons, audiences, might want to be thinking about as we determine how to engage with and uh, support the arts. So I'm going to take the privilege of moderator in uh, starting with a question for Justice Sotomayor, because uh, it's something I have long mused about. In all the various uh, free speech controversies I had to deal with, it was notable that the folks complaining about the art or the performance never actually saw them. Um, and yet, it seems pretty evident to me that certainly in the area of arts and culture, context is essential. You can make anything seem uh, atrocious uh, if you take it out of context. So I, just wondering from a, a legal perspective, in considering free speech issues, how important is context and how do you approach it or evaluating it, taking it into account? Kate, I, I was in, a resident of New York and a judge during those controversies. I, for one, thought the courts uh, acquitted themselves very well during the legal controversy surrounding this issue, and I don't think they were hostile to the arts at all. No, they were not. Um, having said that, I, unlike you, uh, and, and even on a personal level, not as a judge, mm -hmm. I think those controversies may have some lingering negative effects, mm -hmm. but the pendulum tends to swing back after a while. Mm -hmm. 
which is what happened in this situation, those museums are thriving right now. Yep. And some would say that the publicity helped uh, not only people coming to those exhibits, but helped their future exhibits. So uh, there's a balance that one has to take a look at when controversy erupts, because I think it gets the population talking. And there was a lot of chatter around <laughs> these two situations in New York. Mm -hmm. um, and each side passionate about the position they were taking. I, for one, invite that as a citizen. I think it has a, can have a positive effect. And in many ways, that's what art is meant to do. Art is meant to challenge us to think outside, I think, my, our norms. But in answer to your direct question, um, all First Amendment jurisprudence is essentially content-based, um, unlike others, because of the sensitivity we, as um, in, in interpreting the Constitution, have to the to the importance of political speech, and our understanding that speech generally, whether it's art or not, uh, contributes to that political discussion. The court is always looking at it in context. So I'll give you a few examples, OK? Um, during the Vietnam War, now, schools are very special places. And our First Amendment jurisprudence gives a whole lot of leeway for schools to censor student speech. I shouldn't say it as directly as that, but to control it. Uh, and yet, we have also recognized that students have a, a political or a speech right. And so during the Vietnam War, one school prohibited students from wearing an armband, a black armband as protest. And the court struck that down, creating what's been subsequently called the Tinker document, uh, Doctrine. But yet, when we had an issue involving a, a, a sign that said, um, Bongo hits for Jesus, the court said, no, because the context is a school. Schools have every right and compelling interest in dissuading students from being involved in drugs. And uh, the society has a societal interest in protecting its students. And so um, the display of that sign was struck down. So for us, context is always the issue. We had not so long ago, the Schneider case, where a, a church, um, some would dispute that description, I don't, I'll accept it. A church has undertaken to protest at the funeral of every, that, uh, of every uh, soldier who has died in uh, the current wars. Needless to say, their protests are against um, the moral policies of the US. And so uh, the signs are rather offensive to most people. They talk about the US being, um, uh, being damned because of its support of gay rights and a bunch of other things. Um, this particular sign at this particular funeral uh, cast dispersions of the person who had died as being potentially uh, a homosexual, and uh, I don't think anybody quibbled that he wasn't, but putting that aside. Um, when we looked at that speech, we looked at it completely in context. And there are those who criticize us for that because the context was that it was a political statement, um, but it was placed beyond the view of the people attending the funeral. And uh, and so that context was important to us, uh, as was the message of the context, which was pretty much a statement about the government. Now, all of you are likely to read a Supreme Court case and like some and dislike others. Um, and people always ask me, why is that the case? Is there an inconsistency in what the court does? I don't think so. What I think is that society changes. And what becomes acceptable in society grows and changes. And so maybe that's a separate question. But mm -hmm. I think I've answered your particular one. 
I want to follow it up with a question to, to David, because it does seem like this issue of what goes on on uh, campuses, particularly college campuses, uh, is um, an, an interesting and, and troubling trend. I'm thinking about the uh, manifestation of trigger warnings on uh, syllabi, uh, the uh, development of safe spaces on campus, the uh, rejection of speakers by certain campuses uh, because uh, students find their uh, political views to be uh, objectionable. What do you think uh, this is fundamentally about? Are we at a moment of greater intolerance? Is free speech doctrine being uh, distorted beyond its uh, fundamental purpose? Well, I think in that specific case, I think there's a, uh, a, a pseudo-religious impulse for purity being played mm -hmm. out on college campuses. But the harder case is the, the tension between freedom and conviction in both these cases. And so to me, coming from outside the world, the arts world, I don't particularly think we have a free speech problem. I think most things are allowed to be said and the internet full of, full of things. I think we have the opposite problem. Some things that shouldn't be said. <laughs> but, not, but not by law, but by just self-censorship. But my columns most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> But, and so I come to it from an opposite point of view that we don't have a free speech problem, we have a conviction problem and insufficient commitment. And so I was actually thinking, sitting here with Oscar, Oscar doesn't know what he changed my life. Uh, For the I love you too. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I come from DC, this world. It's the most emotionally avoidant city on the face of the earth. Uh, and I sit on a lot of panels at Brookings and places like that. And. Uh, my face lights up at the phrase panel discussion. That's just <laughs> uh, and so I got invited probably four or five years ago to do a panel at the, at the public. And we, it was like a theater world, not the Brookings world. So we're like backstage, we did a group hug, which was different. We don't do that at Brookings. Uh, then like Anne Hathaway sang a song and Bill Irwin the Clown was funny. Then we, there were like tissues in case we started crying on stage. And so it was an introduction to the world of emotion. Mm. and love. And so that's about commitment and conviction. And it struck me that when what we have in this country, especially among my students and especially among a lot of people, is the inability to make commitments. And they can't commit to vocation, they have trouble in their 20s and 30s, they can't commit to a family, they can't commit to a village, they can't commit to a faith or philosophy. And so there's just a, an inability to find a way to commit. And it seems to me what the arts does is it teaches you new things to love and it arouses that love which forms the conviction. And when people form a conviction, they have to know how to deal with it. And so a lot of the people on campuses or in the case of Piss Christ or whatever, they've got a conviction that it turns absolutist. And it seems to be the way to manage this, um, these conflicts between people who want convictions and who feel insulted by Piss Christ, say, is frankly not in your world but in my world. That law is crude, but social mores are supple. <coughs> and that we should disapprove of somebody who does Chris Christ, I think. I think they're immature. I think they're fighting a culture war that was won in 1830. But, uh, but we should never take it into the realm of uh, disinviting speakers. We should never take it into the realm of uh, trying to ban something or close down an agency. But we should always take it into a realm of moral judgment. And do we think such a person who does some of this artwork is worthy of our admiration or, or our disrespect? So David, that's a brilliant statement. And you're right, because most people want the law to take care of mm -hmm. all these problems, but we're, we're ill-suited to it. We're a rough instrument, and you're right. Much of it is teaching people moral corruption. At almost all the colleges mm -hmm. I've been to, um, they take great pride in protecting freedom of speech. And many of them will not let the students win on these battles of who's going to appear or not. Some do, and maybe they're the lesser for it, but I do think you're right. So Oscar, in terms of this issue of moral responsibility, whose is it? I, at the public, you've been on an amazing run of producing what uh, I would call history plays, like uh, David Hare's Stuff Happens, or I guess history musicals, with uh, Bloody Bloody Andrew Jackson, and Here Lies Love, and Hamilton, which was mentioned earlier. But in all of these cases, the historical record is manipulated in some way. Uh, Certainly the musical form, most of us, I don't know about you guys, but you know, don't get to break into song and dance. So um, you know, that's, that's a fundamental uh, 
change in uh, the representation of the factual record. Do you think artists get a special kind of dispensation um, in terms of freedom of speech when dealing with historical fact? How, how do you understand artistic responsibility when it comes to history? It, it depends on what you mean by special dispensation. I think artists get the same dispensation that everybody else gets, which is they get to tell stories, and they get to tell stories that represent their point of view on those stories. Um, there's category problems. Uh, Mike Daisy, who many of you know, got an awful lot of trouble because he went to uh, uh, China to the Apple factories and came back and reported on the horrible condition of workers. And what he actually did was pretend that he had actually physically witnessed things that he had only read about. All of the things he reported actually happened, but he on stage pretended that he had been there and seen them himself. And that was a violation of the contract with the audience because that specific show was a first person narrative in which Mike was saying, I saw this. And that's not a legal contract, but it is a binding aesthetic contract. The audience, in other words, was misled into thinking something was first person journalism when it actually wasn't. That wasn't acceptable. And, you know, indeed, what we came up with was sort of a you know, actually in conversation with Mike, we have a, we, we will now fact check any piece that claims journalistic status at the public theater, because if we want to have a place at the table with the grown-ups, if we want to be able to talk about public issues, we have to apply the same standards to us that journalists will. But the vast majority of what we're talking about is historical fiction. It's fiction. Things are being made up. And any piece of historical fiction will make some things up that has to, otherwise it's not a work of art, it's not a work of fiction. The question is, what is being made up? Why is it being made up? What does it change or distort about the historical record by making something up? I'd use the, um, something that we probably all saw, the Selma controversy, for example. There's a controversy about something that happened in Selma that showed LBJ uh, direct, seeming to directly approve the release of the sex tapes to Martin Luther King. That was probably a mistake, I think, artistically. However, the, 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 the furor that rose up about it was actually a furor that had ideological content. The content being, shall we let an African-American woman actually tell the story of one of the great victories of the civil rights movement and make the African-American people the heroes of it, not the white president, who, by the way, was not shown as a villain. That was the ideological content of the argument. So you always have to look for the ideology. You always have to look for what is actually the content of the point of view. And I don't think we get dispensation, but I think that people will often use essentially minor inaccuracies to try to, to try to actually cover up an agenda of fighting the point of view of the artist. So this issue about agenda, certain, a lot of the, the uh, legal opinions around freedom of speech uh, reference things like common sense and the marketplace of ideas, implying that there should be a degree of self-regulation. You, you referenced this before, Justice, but, but do you see the continual churning of free speech issues as a failure of our society self, to self-regulate, or is it uh, a uh, reflection of the fact that freedom of speech is a fundamental inefficiency in a society that's constantly trying to reshape itself and figure out which direction uh, taste is evolving and what's acceptable in terms of intensity of expression is evolving? Both things. Yeah? Yeah, no, no, no. I, I, we're all often in search of black and white answers, uh, particularly in the law, and mm -hmm. the reality is the law is gray. That's why I have a job. <laughs> because if the law was completely clear, they w you wouldn't need judges. And you have judges because of that gray. Um, it is reflective of the vibrancy of our society. Um, a few years back, we had a case involving a California law that um, controlled the sale of very violent videos to children. And these videos are particularly graphic and almost, not quite, lifelike. And they depicted um, the killing of police officers and then a fairly offensive uh, act of uh, urinating on them. 
And needless to say, uh, you couldn't have worse bad taste. Um, one of the uh, amici brief pointed out the historical reaction to, um, to similar violence in our society. And it was pointing out that some localities had banned uh, depictions of ser serial killings um, in cartoons. Um, some jurisdictions had uh, considered banning some uh, uh, fairy tale stories, children's stories, because of their goriness. And if you think of some of them, they're pretty Hansel and Gretel, isn't it? Uh, pretty extreme. Um, I don't think today you would get ever someone uh, trying to censor those things. And we've moved so far beyond that stage. Similarly with obscenity. We've come a very, very long way since Potter Stewart's I Know It When I See It. Um, I've been a judge on the Supreme Court now just six years, but I can't tell you that I have a lot of obscenity cases, but all of them involving children. I, I, I do not remember looking at a petition involving, a petition for review involving adult obscenity. Although we had another case involving um, animal cruelty films. And um, we sort of ducked the First Amendment issue there. We sometimes do that. And we went on a statutory ground to, to, um, uh, to strike down the, the, um, the statute prohibiting that. But my point is that, that it's always a combination of things. It's a discussion within society and it's our evolution. The fact that we grow and we permit more and then we counter in other areas and maybe because of conviction or, or other reasons. But I think we're always gonna have that controversy. So fundamentally it's a, it's a, it's a healthy part of the machinery. Exactly. So can, I, can I say something about this agenda word used? So as a consumer and not a producer and not an administrator of the arts, my perception is the arts world uh, has too many agendas, that it's over-politicized, under-emotionalized, under-moralized. And that to me, what I, I think most people go to the arts for is to educate the emotions, to learn from Sophocles about agency, about how much we can control in life, to learn from Hamlet, uh, the clash between an classical value system and a Christian value system, to learn from Kendrick Lamar about anger. And we, we want to widen our repertoire of emotions. And when I look at the contemporary art world, I see, uh, frankly, a lot of political agendas uh, and too much effort to go into the realm of politics. Uh, and to me, that does violence in two ways. The first way is it tends to simplify politics. Politics is usually a boring clash between partial truths and the search for a position of more emotional purity, which artists want to go for naturally, often simplifies what is a, an issue. And second, it takes the arts out of their core business. To me, the humanities have lost so many major, majors and are really more and more abundant on campus because they, uh, they, went into, they left the internal world, which was their core mission, and they went into the world of, of the external world of either politics or race, class, and gender, which the social sciences just do better. And if they're not teaching us how to live internally better lives, they're not really fulfilling the deepest thing they bring to us. And to me, the modern art world has done the same. Oscar? Wow. Um, <laughs> I, that was directed right at you. Thank I, you. I was just going to say, that was and a great indictment. <laughs> I still like you so much. <laughs> Give me five minutes. Despite the fact that I think you are making a, a compartmentalization of what art is good at that is completely not my experience. And I think it would shock Shakespeare to hear that what he was doing wasn't political. I think it would, sh it would uh, frankly, I think the Greeks would stare blankly back at you and not know what you were talking about. <laughs> um, uh, man is a political animal, and uh, human beings are political animals that in politics in the sense that our social relations to each other are the core of what defines us as human beings. There isn't some pure inner Oscar self emotion that exists separate from my relationship to you, David, and our relationship to each other. And the theater in particular, I'm not qualified to speak about the other art forms, 
embraces and celebrates that. It would complete, I, I would fail utterly at my job if I thought somehow I should narrow and confine myself to the moral education or even the moral sensitivities of my audience. It's precisely the fact, what makes Shakespeare our greatest playwright is there's no such thing as a private relationship in Shakespeare. Everybody who falls in love with each other have parents. Those parents have princes that they're loyal to. They have friends, they have communities, they have families. And there, there's never two people who fall in love in Shakespeare without awareness of this whole web of a social network they're part of. It's what makes him our greatest playwright because that's true of all, oh, this is terrible silence. That's, <laughs> that's, that's, that's true of all of us. It's just that the art in our society and so many aspects of society are desperately trying to convince us that we only have our own little selves or our own little families, our own little love relationships to care about. So, yeah, no, I completely I'm, disagree. Yeah, there. so we're not disagree. Well, go but, ahead. But let me say one other thing while we're on it because I think it, it does, you know, we all had things, I'm sure, that we said to ourselves, we're not going to leave this panel without saying. And this is the thing I want to say, <laughs> which is it, it's something that Cass Sunstein calls the cost of rights. Freedom of speech is terribly important in a democracy, but for freedom of speech to mean anything, it matters who controls the printing presses, who controls the venues, who, get, who gets their speech to get heard. And that's not the same as anyone can write anything on the internet. It's where do you have the ability to effectively become part of the public dialogue, which is the thing that I think Rousseau had totally wrong. It's the, the, the place that you can do that is by coming together in a theater, in a public space, and having your voice be able to contribute to that. So I think a huge part of our task as people who care about the arts is how do we make sure that we allow the full cacophony of voices to actually have sites and venues where they can get heard and expressed and responded to? Because if it just, you know, I'm, anyway, you, you can finish the rest of that. Part. But so David, one of the things you're very invested in is the issue of making sure that there's a private space. Uh, I think you've uh, recently written that there has to be a place where you can be free to develop ideas and convictions away from the pressure to conform. And so there almost seems to be a fundamental overlap between issues of privacy and creativity and free speech. Because I mean, one way of looking at it is, do you see free speech controversies as fundamentally about the pressure to conform. A slightly different way of looking at it is, I think, part of what Oscar was talking about is that artists almost always make art from a very personal point of view, and then it's put into the public realm. So it's always an incursion of the private into the, the, the public. Is that a good dynamic? Is the issue of privacy uh, something that, that overwhelms uh, the public sphere? Yeah, well, I would say two things. First, uh, the, uh, a lot of these cultural controversies are about respect, where you, if you're disrespecting my religious uh, totem or icon, you're disrespecting me. Second, a lot of them are frankly uh, fundraising devices that both sides benefit from, from a cultural clash. Uh, and so, you know, I, 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 I want to respond to Oscar. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> I've got a little voice in the back of my okay. head. Go after Oscar, full bore. <laughs> so. I like being an observer. I was going to say, yeah, let's just start here. here. Just bring out the popcorn. You're here to adjudicate it. Uh, you know. uh, That's the jury. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a, a couplet from Samuel Johnson, of all the things that human hearts endure, how few are those that kings can cause and cure. And he means that the, the, uh, the things that really dominate our lives, our value systems, our philosophies, our faiths, our relationships, our communities, are somewhat touched by politics, but mostly not touched by politics. And so let's take the case of Shakespeare. He has a play called Hamlet, and it's about a guy who's got two different moral philosophies at war within him. He's got a, a Greek honor code that says, somebody killed your father, avenge the death. He's got a Christian honor code that says, thou shall not kill. And he has to worry about the afterlife. And so is that a political conflict? I don't think so. I think it's a moral and values conflict. And it's certainly, it, I'm not a asking for a withdrawal into privacy. But, but David, I, I, at the we're going to get really geeky here for a second. <laughs> but as Stephen Greenblatt showed in his brilliant book, Hamlet and Purgatory, one really has to view 
Hamlet's relationship to the ghost as a Protestant son facing a Catholic father. It's pretty clear that Shakespeare's father was a secret Catholic, a recusant, and we found testimony after his death. And that part of the struggle that's going on there is the struggle between Protestantism and the Catholic Church mm -hmm. that within a, a, a year or two was going to lead to the gunpowder plot and attempt to uh, assassinate the entire leadership of, it, in other words, totally in the right. parts. Now, because we're reading it out of that historical context, 400 years ago, you can choose to view it the way you just view, viewed it. Right. But there's no Shakespeare scholar I know that could possibly say that was the correct reading. Right. That's the reading that you're choosing yeah. to make. Okay, I, I, well, Shakespeare. But I, I, I guess my problem with, with each, I think, um, you can't separate politics from human emotions because human emotions drive most politics. And so I think once you're, you're, you're talking about expressing political views in, in art, you're talking about something that's in people, that's driving them to do things. But so you wear a robe for a reason to depersonalize and presumably to de-emotionalize your role. And you're not in an art form. Oh, what, what, and the, how wrong I, you are. <laughs> I, at least I'm consistent. Okay, you are consistent. Well, what I, I, I'll tell, I'll What's tell, I, I have the greatest public forum in the world. I get to write opinions. And um, Oscar was talking about how do you get your message out? Boy, you guys do a good job getting my message out, okay? <laughs> Um, and good lawyering, good judging, is convincing people of your argument. And so we're not performers in that sense of the word. But you got but, a great costume. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, it does save us from having to figure out how, what clothes to wear each day, you know? Um, no, no, no. But to impact through our opinions, we have to ha know the art of persuasion. I, I, and, and so all of those things have emotions that underlie them. Of course. But I just, justice is supposed to be blind. Mm -hmm. Art is the opposite. Yes. Uh, second, and this, is, this was elemental in your confirmation, the use of the word empathy. And I've supported I you. didn't, but. <laughs> right, right. But the role of empathy in what you do. An artist is 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 emotion hardened in craft. Really? Excuse me, say that again? I don't know. I was repeating mm. a truism yeah, I yeah. once read. I don't emotion, know. Is, but I'm sorry, I just didn't hear it. Somebody said this. I, I'm paraphr somebody knows, must knows this. Art, art is emotion expressed. Somebody knows this. Play? In tranquility, there it is. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Emotion. Uh, Recollected in tranquility. tranquility. Do you know? If the law was that all of the time, it would be a very unhuman enterprise. Um, think about uh, Dred Scott, Plessy versus Ferguson. You can't talk about um, opinions, um, the World War II internment of, of the Japanese, which the Supreme Court approved. Um, the court is affected by uh, cultural values, by cultural viewpoints because we're human beings, they're going to affect. So you're right, we're different because we aspire to try to neutralize that. And that most artists don't have to do. And so that may be a difference. And because we are attempting to self-analyze and ensure that we take away those cultural emotions. But I don't know that I, for one, think that it can be done successfully in all situations. And I'd just like to ask before we wrap up, picking up on that personal issue, uh, the, the Kenny Rogers maxim of you got to know when to hold them and know when to fold them. How do each of you self-censor? Because it's, it seems to me that it's essential as part of your jobs of being able to communicate effectively. If you want people to really hear what it is you're saying, you have to speak in language that will uh, be responsibly resonant. I have to say, I really reject the idea of self-censoring. What I feel like I'm trying to figure out how to do is how to communicate effectively in a way that I can be heard and in a way that will land. And that's dialogue. That's not self-censorship. <coughs> there are issues of self-censorship or societal censorship that you know can be very difficult to cope with. Um, it's very, very hard in my sphere uh, for 
any of us to have full, frank conversations about Israel and Palestine. That's just very difficult. It's incredibly loaded. It's incredibly difficult to figure out how to say anything that is going to be heard and not. So, but that doesn't feel like self-censorship. That feels like it's my job. My job is to figure out how to talk about the things that matter most in a way that people can actually respond to and to help artists, other artists do that as well. And when that happens, it's... Um, so, so it's never about biting your tongue. It's about figuring out uh, a, a route to connect. It's, it's, it, if it ever is just about biting my tongue, I feel like I'm failing. David? I, yeah, I, I would make the distinction between substance and process. So the substance, you should never self-censor. Uh, my job, as you can tell, is to be consistently wrong. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's to, it's to provide a context in which other people can think. It's to provoke and provide a context in which other people can think. That's my job. Uh, and so I recently, I, a lot of people are going to go to commencements this month, and a lot of people are going to give a book called Oh, the Places You'll Go by Dr. Seuss. Now, I advise you to read that book. It's about, we tell a kid how brilliant he is and how he should take a solitary road to fame and money and success. If you actually read that book, it sends horrible values. Uh, and so I wanted to do a column uh, attacking that book, very popular book. Uh, and a, some friends of mine said, don't, it's so popular. But that's, of course, why we do it, because it's so popular. So you do that in order to provoke a reaction and provide a context in which other people can think. But the way you do it, there should be a fair bit of self-censorship, I believe if you want to use that loaded word. Mm -hmm. And that means, first, there's a natural human inclination to think you're smarter than others and better than others and more right than others. Try to restrain that. Uh, obviously failing. Uh, <laughs> but second, do it in a manner that is likely to persuade to meet people where they are and always, always show that, you're, that the truth is a competition, or the debate is a competition between partial truths and therefore the people who do disagree with you uh, are probably got a piece of the truth. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm a conservative on the New York Times op-ed page. Um, <laughs> my joke is it's a job I liken to being chief rabbi at Mecca. Uh, <laughs> and so if you're in my job, you've got to show deference and respect mm -hmm. to the people who disagree with you, and that's a useful self-censoring mm -hmm. if you want to put it under the front. Justice I live with self-censorship because of my position. Um, on a panel like this, in every forum I'm at, I, have to ensure that not one word I utter could be viewed as a, as a fixed position on any political social Jeez. issue. Jeez. <laughs> All right. Uh, um, no, 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 no. And, and that goes back to what the societal expectations are of judges, that we're this sort of um, uh, justice is blind and impartial. Um, we are the fairest of people. And that is a, I don't want to call it a fiction, but that's an expectation that I talked about judges aspiring to. And I don't want people to feel that I've rejected the presumption that that is, that attempting that is our role. And so I'm constantly in self-censorship, very careful about what words I utter and how they could be misunderstood. I am constantly thinking about the reaction of readers to my words. Um, and, and, you know, I have to give up rhetorical flourishes for the same reason you do. Not to, because I want to engage the reader, but because rhetorical um, flourishes are often seen as reflecting a position that people disagree with. And so I really have to be careful of that. But I think what they were both saying, Oscar and David, is that we are engaging with the public constantly. And if we want our views to be heard, I, I, it's inevitably, inevitable to self-censor. But that's what morality is about, too. Um, morality is about saying, even though I want to do something, I'm not going to do it, not necessarily because it's bad for me, but because I perceive it's bad for someone else. Hurtful. Thank you so much. It's an extraordinary privilege to be here with these three panelists. Thank you. This was fun. So much fun. Pause for one second. Maybe we can take one or two audience questions. Don't right. ask my position on any of the cases, OK? <laughs> <laughs> Great. So if you raise your hand, we have one or two broader. And well, I'm standing right here. Howard's right here. 
it was great. It was great that we started with Ai Weiwei, but I'm interested. Do you think at all, any of you, that because everything is now transmitted worldwide, that our um, own philosophical values need to be um, at all muted um, because there are such different values which can lead in the cases of the Danish cartoons or Charlie Hebdo into uh, very, very into carnage. I think it's a very, very complicated question, Howard. I, the, the, the stance that I view it always is we are trying to get into dialogue with everybody we can get into dialogue with. Um, that we have to support the freedom of artists to express the, what they believe, because if you don't support that freedom, there's no actual dialogue. But at the same time, you've got to be smart about how do you empower people to actually take place, take part in a dialogue, and not simply feel like the values that we're imposing, backed by the enormous financial resources that we have, are giving us a loudspeaker when nobody else has a voice at all. I, I guess I would, I would say there's a two-tier system. There's one class of people who we, we give awesome respect to in society, Harvard professors, uh, who behave by certain standards and, and uh, engage in dialogue. And then there's another group of people who are sort of countercultural clowns on the outside. I don't say that negatively, I say that honorably, honor, honoring that. Um, <laughs> but, let, you know, so this is where Charlie Hebdo comes in. Is that a backward compliment? <laughs> I feel like a countercultural clown. So <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a cultural clown, I'm a mainstream cultural clown. Uh, so Charlie Hebdo is a, I think we need those people because they say outlandish things that sometimes we need said. But we don't accord them the same respect as a Harvard professor because they play uh, in a different uh, sandbox. Uh, and so I, I think uh, people who are sort of in the uh, establishment world uh, should behave respectfully and be deferential toward, but, but those people, we need them, and they get to be undeferential, and they get a little more freedom and a little less respect. We may have agreed on something. Oh, no. <laughs> The one, the one thing that I just also wanted to add, though, is that I think cultural organizations are not necessarily very good at being part of the dialogue when it comes to explaining slash defending why they do work that can be provocative. Os Oscar is a shining exception, but uh, one of the more complex content issues I dealt with when I worked for the city uh, involved a show that featured a very pornographic video, and when I talk to the curator. I, I would try and see everything controversial before it actually opened to the public, so I would just know what was coming and occasionally could make some helpful suggestions about how to initiate the public into certain kinds of work. But when I asked the curator to talk to me about the value of this piece, his response was, it's a classic, um, which really didn't give me a lot to go on in terms of trying to make the case to uh, anyone about uh, why this was a useful part of the conversation. I think social media has amped that up in that uh, anyone can critique and therefore the need for artists and organizations to be able to explain uh, needs to ratchet up proportionally. Okay, in the interest of free speech, I think what we should do is we're gonna take three rapid fire questions as succinct as Howard's was and then you guys can choose which one to answer and then we'll, we'll wrap. But then we, we have a little free speech that way. So first question okay. right here. Okay. It's kind of interesting. My question was sort of similar. I was, throughout the day, I, I think we've been talking about America, the United States, even though we had Ai Weiwei, and I was just wondering to the extent that globalization is reality, um, how that would affect people's thinking, you know, in this specific conversation because not everyone in the world or most of the people in the world I think in many places don't have the same views of speech that, that we do here and you know okay. we have to acknowledge that. Over here. Hi. I'm a high school drama director in Cleveland, Ohio and there's an interesting case of a high school that just had its musical shut down because it, the music director wrote it and it had religious themes and a group shut it down in the name of separation of religion, you know, 
church and state, say because it was religiously themed, uh, they were able to somehow shut this musical down. Have you, have you heard of this case? I I'm haven't, sorry. I'm afraid. Yeah. Pardon no, me? I, have. I just wondered your opinion on it. Okay. So Especially the judge. <laughs> and last question, you can go right here. Do you want to So we've got globalization, the high school musical being shut down, and? and this is opera during this, uh, this season at the Met, uh, Klinghoffer, the tale of Klinghoffer was not broadcast it was not broadcast. It still went on on stage in, in New York, but didn't come here. I was offended. I think the music's beautiful. I wanted to see it when it came and was broadcast live, and it wasn't. So I would like to see if somebody would like to discuss that decision. Okay, and who so decided? John Adams offer a death of Clayton Hoffer, where there was a compromise, kind of a walk back. One of you has to take the legal case, because um, it, you never know if it's going to come before the court. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so that one's out. So well, sorry, we'll do that on, on the separate if, time. Uh, if I could just quickly say about Klinghoffer, I agree with you completely, ma'am. I think it was a mistake not to broadcast it. Um, and I was, David's newspaper briefly gave me a sense of enormous importance because when the article ran on it, my name was quoted above the fold as supporting Peter Gell uh, uh, putting on the opera. And by the time I got to the end of the article, I realized that my name was up front because there was no other artistic leader in New York City who was willing to go on record supporting that. And I have to say, that is not because they didn't support it. It's because they were worried about the impact of saying it. And that's, that, that's just where, that's where questions of self-censorship. But that's another case where no one objecting to it had actually seen it. Right. I think that, yeah, we should probably close with that. But I would say, just to follow up briefly, Oscar, I mean, there's free speech as a matter of law, obviously. And then there's a free speech as a matter of prudence and self-censorship morally, perhaps. And then there's free speech based on economics. And I was thinking about our session with uh, Michael Sandel in the park yeah. when he, when uh, Vanessa Redgrave quoted from, from Romeo, the apothecary, yeah. my poverty can sense but not my will, right. was the quote. Exactly. And I think there's something in that that's... Well, the, it's the, if, if I could, Kate, the only other thing I'd say about the sensation question is I was so dismayed that all of the attention around sensation was focused on whether the works of art were upsetting people with religious convictions, when the most upsetting part to me was about the relationship of large money to a museum exhibition in a city-owned museum, because there was a large sponsorship of that. And the, we, we don't question money in the same, we some, some, some Supreme Court decided that it was a form of free speech, yeah. spending money. It's, it's, um, <laughs> sorry. I didn't join that opinion. Yeah, I know, <laughs> believe me, I know. Um, or I wouldn't have joined this panel. But um, <laughs> the, uh, it's, it's, just, it's so important that when we talk about um, freedom of speech, that we talk about giving people the ability to have that freedom of speech regardless of their economic power. Exactly. Because economic power has been. All right. We want to thank this panel. Thank you, Kate, for moderating. Justice Sotomayor, David, and Oscar. Thank Oscar, you. in fairness to those of my colleagues who have a different view, and I'm articulating the, theirs, I don't think their position is that um, they're depriving anyone of speech. They think that people who have money shouldn't be deprived of no, the right as well. I understand. I, it's a question of equality for them. I'm not going to argue with you. Yeah, no, no, because I, <laughs> no, no, it's because I'm not, I'm not taking a position other than the ones that I've done publicly in my opinions, but I'm trying to be fair to right. those and, who and do. Just the, the position of, of people like me is that money has so much power in our society that it is a rightful role of government to figure out how to even the playing field for those who don't have money. Right. Rather than All right, thank you so much. Oh.